All right, everybody, thanks for coming out. Uh, my talk today is on active defense, helping threat actors hack themselves. My name is Matt Shear. You can follow me on Twitter at C3RKH. And also, the slide deck is currently out there on slideshare.net slash circa. So uh, if you want to follow along or uh, come back and take a look at it later, uh, that information is out there. And with that, I'm going to get started here. Again, the uh, name is pronounced Matt Shear. I'm a system security engineer with First Financial Bank. I'm also the chair for the Simpa Security SIG down in Cincinnati. So it's a uh, local InfoSec meetup group. We meet the third Thursday of each month. If you go to meetup.com, sign up to the Tech Life Cincinnati group, uh, our monthly meetings are posted out there. Uh, I've also spoken at uh, DerbyCon uh, 5 and 7, and they attend the annual uh, Northern Kentucky University Cybersecurity Symposium. And uh, apparently, uh, besides Columbus, uh, once before, a couple hours ago. Uh, but uh, here it goes again with the extended edition, the director's cut, if you will. So I have a few certifications. All right, enough about me. Um, as seen on the previous slide, I do have a day job. Uh, however, the opinions expressed are solely my own and do not express the views or opinions of my employers. Um, and so just a real quick uh, disclaimer, get the boring stuff out of the way and get to the fun parts. Um, so the material presented is made available for informational and educational purposes only. Use of these tools and techniques is at your own risk. The presenter, me, hereby disclaims any and all liability to any party for any direct, indirect, implied, punitive, special, incidental, or other consequential, da consequential damages arising directly or indirectly from any use of these materials, which are provided as is and without warranties. Now that we got the boring stuff out of the way, um, just a quick slide on what active defense is. There's a Wikipedia article on it. I'm going to focus primarily on the uh, second half of that, which is in the cybersecurity arena. Active defense may mean asymmetric defenses, namely defenses that increase cost to cyber adversaries while reducing cost to cyber defenders. And we're certainly going to touch on that later. Um, so question might come up, why should I try my hand at active defense? Um, so regardless of which end of the debate you fall on for legalizing hacking back, uh, there are plenty of good arguments on both sides of the issue. The fact is, right now, today, it's still illegal um, to hack back. So active defense is the next level beyond honeypots, honey files, and honey nets. And so our objectives today are to cover how to shield and protect legitimate users at all times. And we want to be very diligent about protecting innocent site visitors. Uh, then we want to frustrate malicious threat actors attempting to steal and exfiltrate data through unauthorized access, preferably by unwittingly hacking themselves. And then finally, see objective number one. Again, we want to keep the users safe, and we're going to spend the first part talking about that. So our presentation focus is going to be on active defense for a website. And we're going to do that by baiting and setting traps for script kiddies and other cyber criminals. So some inspirations for this talk. Uh, many years and many pounds ago, I was doing a lot of martial arts. I didn't spend a lot of time in Aikido, but a little bit. The philosophies, though, of sort of using an opponent's energy or force against them has stayed with me for all these years. Uh, I'm not sure how many original thoughts my father had, but one of his brilliant ones was how he would handle junk mail when he, he would get it. Um, he would essentially take out the parts that were attributable with his name and address on them and basically mail them back to the rest of their sales and marketing stuff. With his reasoning being, I'm costing them postage both ways. If more people did this, we'd stop getting so much junk mail. Um, so I remember that from a kid, good stuff. Um, also from the or the opening slide deck um, slide, nature, animal defenses certainly play into it. And then some of these things are nostalgia, and they go back from stuff I looked at so long ago that it would be hard for me to source them now. Um, but everything old is new again. Um, also, I'm a security-minded individual, but I'm still definitely a prankster at heart. Uh, and finally, vigilante nature. I don't mind seeing bad guys kind of get what they deserve. And so that's sort of uh, definitely inspiring on this. So some conventions used um, using what I call a hot water index. This is by no means a substitute for legal advice. Talk to your legal departments, talk to an attorney before you consider doing this stuff. However, I'm trying to give you some best guesses 
from my limited knowledge on what may or may not get reported for hosting malicious content. And so we start uh, cold, which is less likely, all the way up to hot, which is uh, you know chance you could get reported. Um, kind of a quick note on that that uh, you know I sort of liken it to uh, I, we're the Columbus Police Academy, so I sort of imagine I would almost bet a chicken dinner that before the end of the year uh, somebody is going to call the police department to report that they were trying to buy some illegal street drugs and instead got robbed of their money. And it's kind of dumb that they'll call the police to report it, but the same could happen here. So, protecting legitimate users is, again, our top concern, and so there's some ways we do that. Um, one is we create a robots text file, uh, we create a sitemap, and then we make sure that we're not linking to any of our active defense content. So we're going to use a link checker or a hyperlink checker just to verify that we're not actually referencing anything that a legitimate user could happen to stumble upon. We want to be very careful here with all of these things. Um, the interesting thing is, um, I've heard it in a couple talks today, talking about the robots text file, and actually that becomes very often a seed for what the bad guys go to target, because that's the stuff you're essentially putting that keep out sign on. Um, and so the other thing I want to talk about is, normally you would want to disable directory indexing, and you should for any legitimate web content. However, for active defense content, we actually maybe want the bad guys to find it. So actually leave indexing on, so when somebody goes to a web folder, they can actually see what the contents are, and uh, we'll talk about what those defenses are, and you'll understand why a little bit. Um, and then also potentially protecting yourself by making use of authorized user-only messages. Uh, may or may not prove to be helpful, but I don't think it can hurt. So the robots text file, you can read the uh, reference on the formatting uh, from the link at the top. Uh, but essentially the first line tells the site where the sitemap file is. Uh, user agent star essentially says, regardless of what web browser or web client is hitting the site, um, do not allow crawlers to index any of these folders. Uh, and again, this is where the active defense content is. So essentially this is our keep out sign so that for example, a legitimate search engine is not going to pick up these directories that will honor the robots text file and not crawl this content so it doesn't end up in search engine results. That would be uh, definitely bad to happen. So sort of what goes hand in hand with that is the sitemap XML file. What a sitemap does is essentially tells um, the rest of the internet where they should find the legitimate content and you see the location string with the URL in it. Essentially, that is saying, stay in the root folder. Do not venture into subfolders and, and so forth. Um, obviously, if you had a more complex site, you know, these things would grow a little bit. But uh, for my purposes, I just have a very basic stub page on a domain um, and let the bad guys kind of find the rest. Directory indexes, touched on this a little bit. Um, again, we want to disable that, generally speaking, for all of our legitimate web content. Um, active defense content, uh, we want to actually leave the indexing on in just those locations, and you want to be very careful to make sure it's only those locations. So authorized users only, uh, it's basically a uh, sample disclaimer thing I, I sort of found online, modified for purposes of a website. You know, it may or may not help you if somebody did report you for malicious content to say, hey, we had a post that they weren't authorized, I can see the logs, they pulled this file down. They were really outside their depth, if anything, we should be suing them for going after our stuff. Yeah, that may or may not stand up, but I don't think it can hurt to throw it in there. It's a quick and easy thing to do. First act of defense I want to talk about is something I refer to as the round trip round kit. And the idea behind this is that we create a bunch of DNS subdomain host records pointing back to the loopback address of 127001. And so what happens here is that the harder the attackers think they're hitting you, the harder they're actually just hitting themselves. And uh, I throw some quick examples out here of good subdomains that an attacker is likely to target. Um, and so you can kind of look through the list there, and there's things like webmail and WordPress and auto-discover for people who are trying to understand more about your potential Microsoft Exchange environment, you know, cloud API, 
you know, mobile host. There's a whole bunch of these. Obviously, if you're using these in real life, you don't want to do this. Like, if you really have vpn.yourdomain.com or your VPN concentrator, you know, but then you can pick and choose what you want from the list here. And you can definitely, you know, add or subtract to that as you see fit. So, the second active defense is more of a psychological ploy. Um, I call it stomach fiber or gross out. And so, the idea behind this is that we stage an unreferenced folder from our sitemap XML file, um, and it's got a fake door badge ID template. Um, now, the important thing to note here is you want to make it look convincing, but you don't want it to look exactly like your real work ID badges look because you don't want to give somebody the tools they need to social engineer their way through the front door. Um, so there should be definitely some distinguishing characteristics about that that really make it stand out. Um, and then finally, place some gross out pictures of choice uh, disguised as staff photo headshots. Um, so a quick note here, I have a lot of uh, friends that are very, well, they're characters, and so they like to you know, trick people into things that, you know, before Rick Rowling became a thing, it was Goxy and Meat Spin and Tug Girl, just awful stuff. Um, very horrible. Um, when I first gave a preliminary version of this talk, it was in front of my boss. I couldn't really go too far. I didn't want to end up in the human resources office uh, explaining to them some of the images. So I took some people basically vomiting and uh, put that out there because I figured that was as close as I could tiptoe to the edge without stepping over the line where I get in big trouble. Um, you know, again, it's kind of gross stuff. So yeah, you might get reported for malicious content potentially. Uh, here's an example I threw out there. So I made it look like a door badge, and this is one of the files out there, so I can essentially rickroll the bad guys. Uh, I don't want to make it be queasy in this talk, so <laughs> I went with that example. I hope you guys uh, approve of that. Um, next act of defense I refer to as reflector madness. And so the idea behind this one is we create an easy-to-crack password-protected folder, uh, web folder, and so the bad guys will try to attack this. What's winning aside, though, might not be quite what they expect. And so what I've done is I've taken a web folder, and there's an HD access file, and it points off to a, uh, something only the server can see, a uh, hashed out password file to authenticate a uh, username and password. And again, I made this one very easy to crack, because I kind of want the bad guys to get the sense of, hey, I really didn't. You know, I own these guys now. Um, if anybody here want to take a quick guess what username and password this would be? It's like a horrible one you would see on a router with bad security. Admin and password. Admin password. You nailed it. Congratulations. You just cracked the folder. What you're probably going to find, though, is that you're getting a uh, connection refuse type of error message. Um, but what you might get is something like on the right. If the attacker is running their own web server, that's what they're going to get, <laughs> because this is a borderless iframe that's basically redirecting back to the local loopback address. So if they're running a web server, they're going to see their own server. This could have a lot of interesting results. It could either freak them out, like, why am I seeing my own stuff here when I just cracked this web folder? Um, but it'd be even better if they kind of forgot about it and they didn't really recognize it right off the bat. Maybe had some fields in there. Now, all of a sudden, they're firing off, like, OWASP Zap or Herb Suite, and they're trying to interact with this thing and test for cross-site scripting vulnerabilities in the field. At this point, they're really trying to hack their own web server. Um, and so a quick note about the source code here. Uh, I am not a web developer. I don't even play one on IRC. Um, if I wasn't admitting to this stuff, you might think it was coded by gorillas and apes at the Columbus Zoo just minutes before I got here. Um, so just a uh, little... Yeah, just to forewarn you, it's not maybe the best coding, but I did what I could. So I call this attack going nowhere fast. Um, so I've heard a lot of talk about WordPress today, and it has a pretty rough reputation, and deservedly so. It's got a very checkered past. And honestly, I think some of the, the bad vibes from the past um, are maybe not as warranted today as they once were. That's not to say that there aren't still WordPress problems discovered. But the core product, I find, isn't as horrible as people make it out to be today. The real problem with WordPress is that the plugins 
they're written third party and sometimes independent developers are really bad. And so at any point in time, I sort of assume there's about 20% of plugins, at least for WordPress, that have vulnerabilities in them, either discovered or not. Um, even if they're discovered, people aren't real diligent about updating those things if you don't install your updates. So the problem is in uh, the web development world is there are a lot of people who call themselves web developers, and I already did it, I'm not one of them, um, but really they're just sort of web designers and they're plugin jockeys. So they throw a bunch of plugins to WordPress. So let's say 20% of them are vulnerable, you have 10 plugins, you probably have one or two that's vulnerable to some sort of attack. If you have 20, you just double that, and your attack surface doubles. 30, you, know, you get the idea that it escalates quickly from there, and pretty soon you have a lot of vulnerabilities in your CMS that you weren't counting on. Um, so anyway, getting off my soapbox there, um, sometimes you see it with themes as well, but primarily it's the plugins. Um, but essentially the WordPress login page, because it's so popular, it's one of the most um, attacked or brute force login cracks by malicious attackers. And so on the site here, I have a live uh, wp-login.php page. Uh, and so here's the WordPress login. Does anybody want to guess what the username and password is for this one? Same one? It's not. You can try it. Anybody else want to guess? Admin, admin. All right, thank you. Um, this uh, is actually, there is no username and password that works for it. It's a completely fake page. The whole point of this is to essentially waste the bad guy's time as they spend time trying to brute force username and password fields, and there are no answers. It just winds out the fields and pre represents the same page, and so they get to try it again, um, but they really were never going to get in. But I, I have a lot of fun looking at logs, actually, and seeing, like, the Russian Federation, and just like, keep going, guys, keep trying, don't give up on me. <laughs> I think you almost had it that last time. Uh, so anyway, it's a lot of fun. Uh, a quick note on there, one of, my, one of my pen tester buddies said, you know, that might actually be vulnerable to cross-site scripting. Um, to be honest with you, I haven't tested it out. And the reason for it, normally I'm really diligent about that stuff, but the reason is because it's a site that, or a page that no legitimate user should ever stumble across. So it's only malicious threat actors hitting that site. I have a really warped sense of humor. And sometimes that sense of humor is easily amused. So in my mind, I sort of envision threat actor group A over here trying to do cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, and threat actor group B trying to do the same thing. And now these two groups are just sort of attacking each other unwittingly. And that amuses me. So this attack, or active defense rather, I call act, or pie to the face. Um, so there's a lot to unpack with this strategy. So it starts with disinformation uh, and wasting attackers' time to potentially getting them banned from larger service providers, um, and also burning their own CPU cycles and draining down batteries on mobile devices, including laptops. Um, so we start um, with the inspiration for this, which is really crypto jacking. It's sort of interesting as I started researching this. Uh, it was really back in early December. Uh, it made it a couple new sites and then it kind of disappeared, but I was intrigued by it. So one of the problems you have today is that a lot of websites are compromised, particularly tra well-trafficked ones, and essentially the threat actors have set up crypto mining code within those pages so legitimate site users get a big CPU spike while they're mining cryptocurrency, and it's really been newsworthy in the last few weeks. Uh, so this is actually very timely. And the way I want to sell this is by having a webmaster folder, and inside of it's containing a fictitious bookmarks.html file. And the purpose of this is to uh, stage non-existent login accounts for popular sites and services, and an attacker will spend their time trying to brute force these other services. Um, and then hopefully in the process, they trip whatever alert threshold these providers have, either end up on a threat intelligence feed list, or even just get banned by those people. See, the thing is, if I block this malicious traffic, they can't get to my site, but there are countless other websites that are just going to go and attack next. They're not even going to give it a second thought. Um, I would personally rather they waste a lot of time than find an easy victim um, after trying to, trying to get through me. Um, but behind the scenes, what's really going on, instead of mining cryptocurrency, I'm just calculating pi hundreds of thousands of times, and I get the same effect. 
Uh, and so you'll see inside my bookmarks HTML file, I've got very popular logins for Facebook, Google, LinkedIn, Microsoft Live ID, Twitter, and Yahoo. The uh, interesting thing is that these accounts don't actually exist. Now you could actually, if this, you know, you could actually really register this account in these services. Um, I've never done it, so it's just sort of like our WordPress login, fake login page. There are no corresponding passwords because these accounts don't exist on these services. And some quick just notes on this. Um, Facebook works exactly like I expected it to. Uh, Google, I couldn't actually come up with a, uh, I only spent maybe 10 minutes reverse, trying to reverse engineer the logins. Uh, I couldn't actually get it to pre-fill the Google login, but still, if you list an account there, the attackers can read the plain text. Um, and so LinkedIn is sort of another oddball one. It doesn't work if you're logged off. If you're logged into LinkedIn, it'll send you back to the login page, but it still shows you as logged in. So it's a very weird oddball effect. Um, the other interesting note is Microsoft Live ID. I actually changed the URL. The correct um, variable there is, is username rather than email. The reason I changed it to email is because something I noticed is with Microsoft Live ID, it'll, so Microsoft is an old company. They've been around since the 70s by IT standards. That's, they're very mature. Uh, unfortunately, this security practice sort of goes back to the 1970s because it'll actually tell you if the username is invalid. Not that the username or password is invalid, that the username is invalid. So it'd be very easy for an enterprising attacker to script out um, crawling uh, or basically calling out the URLs and you know basically parsing in the results to actually enumerate valid Microsoft Live ID usernames. Once you have the usernames enumerated, then all you have to do is crack the password because you know the account's valid. Um, so not really the best. I didn't want it to be that obvious for somebody visiting my site. Um, so that's why I changed it up. Interestingly, when you go to the link, there is, when you a sign up field that, or button rather, that will pre populate that username for you um, to create an account. Um, and then um, Twitter and Yahoo work exactly as expected. So, one of the reasons I picked these particular service providers is they're frequently used in single sign on services. You know, think about it, think of all the single sign on services you can get into with your Facebook account or your Google account, some of these other ones. So, it, again, if I block them, not much pain if Google blocks you or bans you or puts you on all kinds of threat feeds. Uh, you got bigger problems trying to attack other things. Um, so just a quick uh, commentary on the source code here. So at the top, you see, and I'm going to touch on this here in just a moment, you see it's refreshing the page every 3.14 seconds. Uh, when you see a whole number, it's pretty obvious it's just reloading the page every three seconds. You throw a decimal point in there, it has this weird psychological effect of you almost disregard it. If you're not really looking close at it, you completely miss it. Um, the JavaScript files that are called are identical files. Um, and so essentially this is what's calculating pi. Uh, as I understand it, this is not a super efficient formula for doing it, which is great because I don't really want efficiency. Uh, in this case, I want slow and inefficient. Um, and I essentially took pi and multiplied it times 100 million to get the enumeration number. I could increase that number and it will actually type the CPU longer. But here's the interesting effect I noticed when doing that is if you make that number too big, the browser window takes too long. It will actually tip off the attacker by popping up and saying, this page is taking an extremely long time to load. Would you like to kill the page? Well, we don't want anybody suspecting anything. So that's why I'm refreshing the page every 3.14 seconds. So it runs its time, refreshes, starts over again. and all of those links back in the bookmarks HTML file, I made sure they opened in new windows. So my hope is that the uh, threat actors will leave this open as long as they can. And so I've seen a web root uh, demo where they show it can spike up uh, on old hardware or just a two core VM, all the way up to 100% on a moderately powered uh, workstation like this, maybe up to 50%. Um, but if they're already running something with a heavy CPU load or a lot of stuff with a heavy CPU load, uh, it'll actually spike it all the way up to 100%. And uh, essentially, that's going to really slow them down. Um, and it's not uncommon to have heavy workloads uh, on their system eating up CPU if they're running a Java-based tool like the Burp Suite, which is often used by you know, legitimate penetration testers and, and the malicious threat actors alike. Um, and then just to note I touched on earlier that heavy CPU loads 
they'll drain batteries on mobile devices, including laptops, um, quite a bit faster than if you're running at a baseline of 6 or 7% CPU. This one I call the wrong answer. Uh, this active defense, uh, I, so I, I'm pretty old school. Any of you who've been around IT for a long time, show of hands. Who here has had to recover our filled up hard drive that is completely full? What are you even functioning on? Yeah, there's a few hands in the audience. I have two, and you know, it's a lot easier now, but back in the day, usually you would have to just pop open the case, pull off the drive, slave it onto another system, leave your case open. You literally have to boot into your regular OS, and then mount, you know, mount the other disk and delete off enough stuff you can get the other one to boot again. And you never put your cases back on so you're sure everything was working right in case you have to do it again. Real nightmare, right? So uh, the idea behind this attack is that uh, we're going to stage a file with an enticing name inside of a unreferenced folder, um, such as a docs, HR, um, employee salary history, XLS zip file. So an enterprising threat actor, they're going to think, yeah, we got the goods. This is going to be some juicy stuff. Really what this file is, though, it's just a renamed version of the infamous 42.zip. For those of you who are not familiar with 42.zip, it is essentially a 42 kilobyte compressed file. Fully expanded will extract to over 4.2 petabytes worth of data. Most of the time, your threat actors are not going to have that much disk space. That's a bad day. This active events I refer to as Bobby Dropkick, and it is directly inspired by this well-known XKCD uh, cartoon where it's called Exploits of a Mom, and I've got the reference to it here. And the school calls the mom and says, this is your son's school, we're having computer trouble. Mom says, oh dear, did you break something? School says, yeah, in a way. Mom says, or then the school says, did you really name your son Robert Drop Table Students? <laughs> oh yes, little Bobby Tables we call him. And the school says, well, we just lost this year's student records. I hope you're happy. And mom says, and I hope you've learned to sanitize your database inputs. So the setup for this is something I pulled from the uh, MySQL Git repository. Somebody actually taking time to put together a fictitious human resources type database. Now they had split it off into multiple mini SQL dump files. Um, I basically imported the whole thing and dumped it back out as uh, one very big um, SQL database file. Um, I recommend probably zipping it up just to uh, have a little less overhead on your web server if somebody tries to download this over and over. But you can go native SQL format. Either way, it's going to have the same effect. Um, so I talked about what this was, but oh yeah, there, there's this thing that uh, has a little extra few lines in, of code in it. Like, not at the very bottom, but above the comment code, where you have to scroll up just a little bit from the bottom to actually see this stuff. Um, unfortunately, MySQL doesn't have an option to drop all of the databases. I tried. I looked for it. But I came up with this. You can drop the internal default databases, and that effectively wrecks the MySQL instance. So the MySQL database, the sys database, the performance schema database, and I put information schema database at the very end. Reason being is that it has some read-only content to it, um, and so it won't really get rid of that completely. I've, I've sort of theorized that it probably works its way through that database to the point where it hits read-only content and then quits. I haven't verified that, but I would imagine that's probably how it works. Um, and so as bad as recovering from a whole or a filled up hard drive is, yeah, trying to recover from a wrecked MySQL instance, if you don't have adequate backups, that's, that's a bad day. And uh, it's sort of interesting because you see a lot of the anonymous posts from a lot of these malicious threat actor groups that, uh, oh, well, they should have patched better and had good backups. Um, it's sort of interesting because a lot of times the attackers aren't really good at defense and sometimes they don't eat their own dog food. And this is one really good way to find out. So I'm not the only person to touch on active defense. I just kind of have it done it a little bit differently. Um, so a good reference if you're looking for an alternative is Black Hills Information Security has ADHD, which is the active defense harbinger distribution. Um, and there's actually a science course, SEC 550, that's based on that specific distribution. Um, they've gone about it a different way, so a large part of what they're doing is um, sort of 
to get attribution. So what they will do is um, stage sort of accidental exposure files like I've done with canary tokens and sort of phone home. So they can ultimately determine where do these files end up, that sort of thing. Um, it definitely looks like a, a, a you know, cool distribution. Uh, if you're looking for another option, uh, might be worth a look. Uh, it's definitely helpful because one of the things they recommend is sort of using that to build out your own threat feed um, to essentially block off you know, the attacks that are coming in. Um, so criticisms for this stuff, I've, I've definitely received a few. Uh, one of my good friends said, you made the Reflector Madness um, folder too easy to crack. You should have made it hard. Well, the good thing is you're in control. You can make that username and password as easy or as hard as you want. So if you want to make the bad guys really work for it to get to the payload, have at it. If you want to make it or keep it simple, no problem there. Um, so sometimes penetration testers will say, this is going to make my job more difficult. So hopefully your external engagements are sort of more white box or gray box by nature, and you're sharing information ahead of time. Um, and so you should have this stuff well documented. And the things that will help them is when you let them know, like, hey, these things are defined in our robots text file. You really don't want to you know, you mess with this stuff because it could uh, mess up, uh, cause you some problems. Um, so that's stuff that you can essentially provide them ahead of time to give them guidance. And the same thing, you know, let them know, hey, the real content that we're mostly concerned with is you know, the things that we've defined in our sitemap file. And then finally, I had some ways, you know, we're not going to implement this stuff. It's going to really make somebody upset, and they're really going to come after us then. Um, you know, the, the challenges I see right now is really the malicious threat actors that are out there today that are compromising websites, they really don't fear retribution. Um, they really, you know, you know, there's no repercussions for it. They're just going to keep hacking these websites because they're not feeling any pain. Um, you know, sometimes if it's nation state sponsored, we give them a good scolding and maybe threaten some sanctions, but by and large, if they don't really see the impacts of that, they don't care, they're just going to keep doing it. Um, and then finally, if you're not convinced that this is a good strategy, you know, take it or leave it. I'm just here to give you guys an interesting, informative talk and, you know, do with it what you will. And so with that, uh, any questions? Anything I've talked about so far? All right, let me uh, do this real quick. I've got some time left. And uh, let me see if I can share out my screen by chance. And uh, if I can do that, maybe I'll do a quick OWASP zap demo and show, sort of show that uh, you know, this uh, stuff can be um, you know, I've sort of talked a lot about, you know, how, you know, that the bad guys can find this stuff. I haven't really spent time talking about, uh, you know, sort of showing that firsthand. Um, see if I can mirror displays here. Yes. All right, we're in business. So this is OWASP Zap, which is the Z attack proxy. This is a free tool. You can go out to OWASP.org and download it. Um, also in Kali Linux, this is included in the distribution. Uh, so it's already there under the web tools. And so uh, I don't really need a persistent session for this. I'm just going to go ahead and start the uh, service and not keep a persistent session. Uh, to show you how easy this is, and sort of a, a step back, um, on the OWASP 2017 list, sensitive information exposure is now up to number three on the list. That's where cross-site scripting used to sit. Cross-site scripting actually has gone down to number seven, and sensitive information exposure is going up from number five to number three. And I can certainly think of a few newsworthy instances where big exposures, big breaches happen because of accidental exposure um, and resulting in compromising millions and millions of accounts. Um, this is actually so simple to do just for that purpose. Uh, literally, I'm just going to uh, punch in my website address and the URL to attack field. I'm going to click the attack button. And what this doing, is doing is this is just crawling my active defense website. 
and retaining all, or basically pulling down the information. And then once we hit 99%, um, and it's going to be a little bit sluggish because I'm just using my uh, cell phone connection, um, I'll go ahead and stop it once it hits 99% because at that point it's really waiting for us to take action. Uh, I'm not going to demo any more of this than just this particular piece of it. And so we're at 99%. And down here, and I apologize it's hard to see, but there's an export button. So I'm going to export it and um, let's call it uh, demo CSV. Export successful. Just open this up in uh, LibreOffice Calc. And you can see it's already got my uh, fields nice and filled in for me. Uh, I'm just going to hit OK here. And um, you can see all the URLs. Again, this is all the stuff that we, in the robots text file, said to ignore. Uh, the great thing is things like wget have a switch, command switch, that will let you ignore a robots file. Um, what's interesting about OWASP and app is it will actually try to use those files um, against, against you. Uh, let see if I can scroll back up here. And you can see, well, maybe it's, I apologize, it's probably a little small, but uh, it's using the uh, robots text file and the sitemap XML file as seeds. So it's actually using those particular files to attack the things that normal web traffic is going to say, ignore this. Um, and sure enough, we come in here and you start seeing things like the bookmarks HTML file. Um, you see the salary history, zip, XLS zip file. Um, at this point, it's trivial, right, just to come in here, copy the field, throw it in a web browser. All of a sudden, I think I've got, um, you know, a salary history um, spreadsheet, and I think I've got, you know, things like a uh, SQL database backup file for the human resources information system. Um, so very simple to do. That's how I know that the bad guys can find this stuff if they're, you know, rather than using like a normal user, actually trying to attack it. Um, so, if there are any other questions, um, I will uh, definitely be around, and I will be at the after party as well. Uh, feel free to hit me up, and uh, again, here's my contact information, and thank you everybody for attending.